Hello and welcome to Springboard, your virtual university. My name is Albert Okran, welcoming you on behalf of Team Springboard, led by Comfort. This is your most inspirational show and that point where the greatest minds in the world converge. Your virtual university is brought to you by the Springboard Roadshow Foundation and proudly sponsored by MTN Pulse, Just Be, the Enterprise Group Enterprise, Your Advantage, UMB Bank, celebrating 50 years in banking and the Central University, Ghana's premier Christian private university. Our media sponsors are the Multimedia Group and the Graphic Communications Group. So welcome back to the engine room, that place where we bring frontliners from various areas of endeavor and get behind the scenes to find out what happens in their lives, the ins, the outs, the tears, the joys, the tough decisions that you would typically not find on the front page of any newspaper. My guest for today has led the transformation of GIPC, the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, into a world-class global hub for promoting investment, not just in Ghana, but I guess across the whole of Africa. Reginald Yofi Grant is in the studio today. Yofi, good to see you. Good to see you, Albert. <laughs> I'm sure for many people, Reginald is the first time the, the, I, 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 bet, I bet it is. I mean, anybody who calls me Reginald must have known me when I was a child, because that's what I was called in primary school. Right. So, <laughs> I mean, our interest for today as we get into the engine room is to explore that amazing job you've done with the Ghana Investment Promotion Center. I happen to come through the office complex for the second time not too long ago. And I was with somebody who asked a simple question, two words. What happened? So let me start with you, Yofi, what happened? <laughs> what happened? That's a, that's a big question. Um, but um, on a very simplistic answer, life happens. Uh, on the other um, so God gives you life, what do you do with it? And I have always believed, ever since I was a child, that, you know, I have this very expansive mind that tells me, well, if you pick on anything and you, you want to be good at it, you will be good at it so far as you put in what it requires to be good at it. You know, and, and so for me, um, I first took over the reins of the leadership of GIPC in February 2017. That's my starting point. What is there? Because for, for, don't be surprised that for many people in Ghana, they would not even know what GIPC is. I have a very, I have a very interesting interest, and I'll tell you shortly, but for the benefit of someone who doesn't know, what exactly is GIPC and what's the mandate? Okay, GIPC is the government's investment promotion agency. We usually call them IPAs. And the primary job is to facilitate, attract, promote foreign direct investment into the economy. And um, you may do so isolatedly or you may do so in partnership with local enterprise. Um, but the, the, the remit is foreign direct investment, really. Why? Foreign direct investment is very important for every country. I mean, if you look at world history, and um, world history is replete with stories of people getting onto ships and trying to find foreign lands. And it was all economic, um, that you go across the seas, go and conquer somewhere. And in those days, it was, you know, a, a very rough time. So they pillage, they steal, sometimes they negotiate and uh, take goods from wherever they went to, brought them to their home country. Um, some of them ended up locating their setting up businesses, etc., etc. And there are many cases of foreign direct investments that happened across the world hundreds of years ago. You know, the cases of Christopher Columbus, Vasco da Gama, you know, um, all these people, Amerigo Vespucci, all, all these people who crossed the land, etc. Even Hannibal, who was um, a conqueror and conquered half the world. And he was supposed to be black anyway. Um, and located in those countries that he, you know, right through to the Roman Empire, which was expansive in conquering space, the, even the Christian church, trying to take over Europe, so moving from Rome into other countries, etc. Those are all cases of foreign direct investments into those economies. From the, from the perspective of the person who is skeptical, mm -hmm. 
they would use words like conquering, taking over, spreading out into to give a one-sided narrative and say, the uh, biggest beneficiary is the person conquering, the person coming to invest right. in that country from the perspective of the country being invested in or that is receiving right. those foreigners. So I only is give there you, any, yes, there I, any benefit? I, I only give the historical perspective that if you go back 200 years, 400 years, 500 years, that's what it was. I mean, so for example, even the Portuguese coming to Ghana and putting a fort in here uh, was some investment they were making in Ghana. Now, did it benefit us? Yes. Because, of course, it, it created trade. So it created a trade outpost that they could trade stuff. Um, of course, the ominous part of that was slavery because um, slaves were virtually you know, defined as a commodity. But they were traded for something, whether it was alcohol, whether it was fabrics, whatever it was. Um, and, 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 but that wasn't all. There were also cases where uh, missionaries came over, they built schools, um, they set up businesses, and all was investing in the economy which they located. Well, in those days, the mindset was not as it is today. The mindset was um, conquer and rule and expand your territory. So most of the uh, supposedly you know, wealthier countries or more developed countries were on an expansionist drive. But that has long since been expunged from... Fast track to 2022. Yes. Help us to appreciate why, as a Ghanaian, I should be excited about foreign direct You know, no country in the world has been an island of growth. No country. Every country has benefited from some interaction with another country. And so when somebody leaves his shores and comes and brings his capital to come and establish your place, he, he, he expands your economy because he's invested in your economy. And um, you said fast forward to 2022. I wouldn't even go that this far. I'll give you three cases in Ghana. So we take a company like MTN, which to date has um, invested close to $6 billion in the Ghana economy. And it's looking to even do 200 more um, on an expansion, 200 million more on an expansion drive. Um, now, they came in to set up a business, uh, a mobile telephony business, um, which has grown into the market leader. Now, but in so doing, what have they done? They've created a business, they've employed people, they've paid taxes, they've also created a platform where other people set up their own businesses whether it's in the Momo space or, you know. So it, it wasn't just the fact that they came and set up a business there and they were looking for their profits to, to repatriate. But they also set up opportunities, growth opportunities. Now, if you look at our Ghanaian economy, um, arguably, over the past 20, 30 years, a lot of the growth that we've seen in the business sector has been driven mainly by FDI. So if you take... Um, the technology space, um, especially on the mobile telephony and services, the mobile services, um, it's been driven mainly by foreign direct investment. So you had MTN, you have um, you had Tigo, you, you now have what it's called um, Vodafone, which used to be Ghana Telecom, which was sold. So there's an infusion of capital to, you know, modernize it and expand its services. Um, and so you've had a lot of Things go on for money that came from outside. Now, if you take mining, which was one of the mainstays of our economy, once again, the big companies that came, came from outside, set up shop here, invested here, created uh, the mines, um, they created jobs, they created other opportunities, and then they grew. Take all the hospitality industry, like the hotels that we've had. Um, it's only recently that we see local um, hotel chains coming up, you know, um, like Aliza, etc. But before, they were all foreign uh, dominated. Right. Uh, so, from what you describe, creating employment, paying taxes, and expanding the economy. But that's not all they bring. A lot of them also bring state of the art management practices, they bring technology, uh, they bring knowledge. Um, which if you pick up, you can use to expand. Uh, I, I can tell you a story that um, one of the sheikhs in um, 
in the Emirates told me, in fact, I was in the presence of um, Vice President Dr. Baumia in Dubai, and we had a conversation. And um, I asked the question that, you know, then this was quite a couple of years back, maybe 2017, yes. And I asked him the question, so the Emirates, particularly Dubai, uh, your population is heavily dominated by foreigners. Um, as I speak, I think today um, the Emirati, pure blood Emirati citizens are about 1.5 million and the foreigners are about 8.5 million. So 85%? Yeah, yeah, of the population is our foreigners. Oh, he didn't ask the same question as you. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, I did. I, I, I did ask him that question. Then he, then he said, you know, my young friend, I have to tell you a story. Because I asked in the context of, you know, we had this situation where we were concerned that we're not, you know, pushing our own people and the foreigners seem to have gained the upper hand in the economy. And so the, the drive to have Ghanaians also become leading, um, leading change engines in the economy was very pertinent and important. And um, um, I, in my mind, I was trying to understand, so how were they able to do it? Because the people there seemed pretty satisfied, you know. And, uh, and so he said, you tell me a story. And he said pretty early in his life, when he, he was sent to school, a few of them were sent to school abroad by his... Um, uncle, who was then the ruler, you know, and they came back. And when they came back, there were very few of them, and so they, they were a prized minority, ultra minority, maybe a five or six or something of them. And so, you know, um, they came back, and when they came back, the uncle said, well, you're going to work. Go and find a job. So then there was one major British company, which was a logistics company. That was about the only multinational then. And he went to find a job that they gave him a job. After three months, he was very unsatisfied. And that's why. He says, ah, because he and a young British boy, he was even better qualified than the British boy. But the boy was being paid about three times what he was being paid. And he thought that, what in my country? You can't come and cheat me and discriminate in my land. You are doing business in my land, and I'm a prince, or I'm royal. So he and his cousins got very upset and decided that to go on a strike. But you know what happened? In, in custom remote, they had dinner with the uncle, like every Friday or something. So at table, they asked, so what's happening in your life? So how is work? And he says, oh, work is OK, but the next Monday, we, we're going on strike. And the old man asked, what's that? What's the strike? Because he didn't know that. He says, oh, we're going to lay down to, we're not going to work. We're going to protest the situation and make sure that we are treated as equal as the British boys who were there. Thank you, Shuki said, really? And they're not paying you well? He said, no, 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 they're not paying me well compared to this bloke. So the uncle paused for her and says, no, you do no such thing. He says, what? He says, no, 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 you're not going to do any history. You go to work. And I'm ordering you, you go to work. And he was a bit upset. He says, ah, these old people don't understand us. They don't get us. How can I, in my own land, be cheated so much? And you have these people, they are the ones who are enjoying life, etc., etc. Wow. He asks her, why? Why shouldn't you go on strike? He says, I first forbid you to even continue talking about it. But I'll tell you something. Then he asked him, what do you have in Dubai? What do you really have? And the, he was the young man that was, well, I don't know. He says, you have sand and you have people. What do you do with sand and people? Very little. The reason I sent you to school was not to come and lord over people. I sent you to school to go and learn. But you haven't finished school. The fact that you've got a degree from America, whatever, it doesn't mean you've finished school. You are now going to start school. You are going to go back to the company. And you are going to learn and learn and learn. That is my order. All of you. So the humbly kept quiet and said, ah, the old man has spoken. What can we do? We'll eat humble pie, go back and go to work and learn. So we stopped, we discussed other issues, other things. But I, the story 
was like, you know, it was hanging. I didn't understand. So you learned, learned, learned. Okay. That, that's what everybody naturally should do. So, somewhere I said, well, Your Highness, please. <laughs> I think your story is incomplete. Then he smiled. He put out, put out a broad smile and he said, Yes, I know I didn't complete the story. So I said, well, Can we have the pleasure and honor of you completing the story? Then he laughed his head off and he says, Well, I own 30% of that company today. I own maybe some 5% of their competitors. I named five competitors, which were global leaders, and he had major shares in all of them. And I said, why is that? And he said, because I listened to the old man. I went back and I learned and learned and learned. I learned the business so well that I got to understand it from the beginning to the end. Now hold and on, you're saying that at the time he was narrating the story to you, he had gone on himself to from an a disgruntled employee, employee <laughs> threatening to go on strike, the Sheikh had now gone on to own thirty percent of that company and by extension five percent or small percentages of their competitors. Yes. Do you ask him what he did differently? Well, he had explained to me what he did. He learned and learned and learned. Now, let me go back to the context of the conversation. And so, and, I, and then at that moment, he said, look, I, I understand the question you asked initially, that your own people will sometimes battle you when you try to bring investors in and stuff like that. But thank God I had an uncle who humbled me and taught me that there was another way I could achieve what I wanted without getting agitated. Because life, progress, is always about knowledge. It's always about what you have and what you do with what you have. And so I did what I did with what I had, which was my education, my experience in the factory and all that. So you, you will think that the biggest benef benefit Ghanaians can get from foreign direct investment is to learn and learn and learn? Absolutely. Not okay. just that. Because when they also come, they create jobs, you know, and they create... And by the way, interestingly, you know, recently we were in the annual investment meeting, which is the largest platform for global investors in, in Dubai. And we normally set up a stand. And who were the other people there? The UAE had a stand also looking for investors. The US had a stand looking for investors. Russia had a stand looking for investors. The German, Germans were there. China had a huge space also looking for investors. And that brings me to my biggest question. In fact, sorry to, to interrupt you, but in all this, I mean, you've won several awards since you came on. How, how long has it been? Two years? No, actually, um, this will be my fifth year. Fifth year, sorry. Naturally, five years, okay. So over the five years, you've won recognition, several awards. My big question to you, if you, when you go out there to these investment fora across the world, with GIPC, selling Ghana, offering Ghana as an investment destination. What do you tell them? What well, do you sell? Well, there, there are two things. Tell First them. of all, the investor wants to know about your country. Why mm -hmm. your country? Is it a safe place? Is there rule of law? Is there peace? Is there security? Is there sanctity of contracts? Is there um, uh, any laws against expropriation? Um, all the things that... Um, a, a bad country has been noted for, are always on the mind of an investor. So if I bring my, what, 500000 or $1 million to this country, is it going to work? Is it going to grow? Is it going to enable me to achieve what I want to achieve? And you see, there's a misconception that um, business people only look for profits. But in practice, at first as an investment banker and then now as somebody in the marketing field, I realize that the typical businessman entrepreneur beyond the profits looks for growth he wants to grow his market which means that he he will get more rewards more profit but he wants to grow his business so even if he's making money he wants to make more money by expanding his business you know so it's not just a question of he comes to invest there and then okay he invests his first money and that's it no he builds a business and expands the business and grows the business you know, and so we see all these things. So, but first, they need to understand that the country in which they are offers the opportunity for growth. 
So you have to do quite a bit of country branding. And my aim in 2017 was to put Ghana squarely on the map. That if you mention Ghana, people know where it is, people know what it's for, and people understand brand Ghana. What are the biggest attributes of brand Ghana in your opinion? Well, um, there's one that's an intangible. And you I said the last time the president mentioned it, he says he doesn't really know what practically it means, but it must be important enough that we are in the center of the world. Ghana is the only country on latitude zero and longitude zero. Now, it's a feel-good factor that people just love to hear. But apart from that, the fact that relatively in Africa we are known as democratically stable, politically stable, is a major plus. Because for the investor, it means that there, there must be some level of predictability in the market. If there's a stable country, then you know that if you are there, you can be there for the next 10 years. Things are not going to change radically. So that's one. Secondly, we are known for uh, our respect and uh, love for the rule of law. Um, so, yes, it's relatively orderly. Um, people can depend on the law to defend them or to do the right thing. Um, and then, thirdly, what are the people there like? Ghana is known for this natural mystic of happiness and you know, freedom that we have. Um, that you know, people seem free, people are happy. I mean, they may not have all that they need, they require in their lives, but they are comparatively happy. So it's a happy place. And then the fourth one is the fact that Ghana seems to have established in the minds of a lot of people a country that is on the move and on the go. Right from independence, spearheading the whole African political emancipation. Um, and then also um, having a, a, a plan of development um, and progress. And even more recently, um, having established the trends of transformation in our economy. And it's interesting because then you see um, that then they start to look at the numbers. So what shows that? And, and from 2017 to 2019, Ghana's economy was one of the fastest growing in the world. Even during the COVID period, uh, when many economies were in recession, Ghana did not go into recession. We still grew, never mind that it was just a 0.4%. One of about only 26 or 27 economies in the world that had positive growth. Even post-COVID, as we are now experiencing, in 2021, when many countries were still grappling with the ravages of the pandemic, um, we've shown some strong resilience and still grown at about 5.4%. For the third quarter of 2021, I'm told grew by 6.6%. The fourth quarter grew by 7%. So the trajectory was back there. So when you sit at the back and look at this small country, Ghana, with 31 million people in, a, in West Africa, which has a population of maybe about 370 million, or in Africa, a population of 1.3 billion people. You want to see which countries are on the move. And the investor wants to see that. So that's why brand marketing is important. That is why are we, are we doing well with that? I think we are. We've done tremendously well because now the more I, I go out and the more I see Ghana, the more attention I get. And we are totally being inundated with, oh, come speak to us, come to our country, come and do a business, bring your, your local business people, come to our country and come and do um, some sort of investment roadshow. Um, they recognize the African market and they recognize Ghana as a leader. So maybe Ghana is the entry point and the hub into the thing. So now we speak about the country branding. As I you've done that very well, then you go to the opportunities in your country. What are the opportunities? So you see Ghana <clears throat> as it is. We are resource rich very resource rich we have gold we have diamonds we have wood timber we have good forest land we have good woods um, we have manganese we have bauxite we have iron ore we have lithium we have oil and gas um, and and so we do have those resources which we can use to convert and grow our economy now erstwhile we've been exporting these raw materials and resources uh, but the recently, the president has clearly uh, carved a new thinking that says, let's stop this wholesale export of our raw materials and resources. And let's add value in situ. Why is that important? It's important because, first of all, if you are just going to dig out the gold and export, you don't need any real, you know, should I say critical mass of 
of well-healed, well-educated population. You need labor. Um, but then what happens? When you export, you're exporting at the lowest end of the value chain, at the lowest price possible for that resource. And so I always use the, uh, the example of cocoa and chocolate. Ghana and cocoa, we export some 67, around that side, percent of the cocoa beans in the world. That whole 67 percent is worth only some seven to eight million, eight billion dollars at best, averagely six billion dollars. The chocolate industry alone in 2021 was estimated to be growing at about at a rate that would um, grow to a 160 billion dollar economy. Now we produce 67 percent of the raw materials. And yet we make less than what? So if we put six over, you know, we make about 2.5% of the revenue of chocolate. Indeed, for every bar of chocolate you sell, the, the um, cocoa farmer gets less than 3%. You know? these, are, these, are, these are stark numbers that you, you, you put out there. And our interest for now would be, be how much progress have we made over the past Right, five years in right. attracting the kind of investment that you go out there to see come into our country. There's so much you can do. There's so much you can see. Have we seen tangible responses? Have we seen inroads in that direction? Absolutely, how absolutely. Now the reason why I was telling you, I'm giving you the cocoa example, is to tell you the opportunity that we have. Now, to one, do it here. yeah, one of the things which has become even more important to me is the uh, idea that we should industrialize. Mm. And what I was getting to, that the president said, we are not going to export our raw materials. We have to add value here. Um, and what, what does that ring in your minds immediately? Then you need the investment to make it happen. We all are aware of what the recent situation is. Post-COVID, almost every economy is grappling with one issue or the other. Many economies have borrowed to the max and to the hilt. I mean, I was in the US recently, and they had a big board in DC, big LED board that was showing national debt and it's 30 trillion. I said, wow, 30 trillion. We can't even conceptualize that in my terms over here. And so every country is going through a struggle and a bit. But we have designed a transformation agenda, what I call a transformation ecosystem. That means that uh, we would have to partner with investors um, to grow our economy in a sustainable way. And partnership means that we will go out, look for the foreign direct investment that we require, and make sure that it works for our people, either partnering with them as equity holders or creating the supply chain and the value chains where our people can be immersed so that they can also build capital and build wealth to grow. At the end of the day, the most important thing of any economy of a country is stability to grow wealth. Are the investors hearing this message you are sharing? Are they coming? Absolutely. Give us an idea about some of them. Absolutely. So um, last year, I, I went to a conference and, a, and an exhibition in Dubai. And uh, I met a company called IFCO. Um, IFCO uh, into the food business. They're one of the biggest food, um, um, when I say food, processed food um, companies in the world, as well as in cosmetics, chemicals, and everything. And um, I had a chat with one of the uh, directors, 10 minutes chat. And he just said, well, we sell goods in Ghana, but I need to know a bit more about Ghana because I, I heard you on a panel and you spoke very well. You seemed convincing. Tell me about your country. So a 10 minutes pitch. And I said, gosh, this must be the sale of my life. I mean, this is the sales pitch of my life. And God help me. Let me connect with something. We didn't even finish the 10 minutes. I spoke for five minutes and he started asking me questions. Ask me this, ask me that, ask that. And I said to him, look, it's good that you do business in Ghana, but it's not good enough. Come and manufacture in Ghana because you, there's ample opportunity in West Africa for you to export from Ghana to West Africa and for you to export from Ghana into Africa. I gave him the numbers, the market sizes, West Africa, 370 million, Africa currently 1.3 billion, the white Ghana, because I think that Ghana offers an opportunity for you to onboard your business pretty quickly. Um, we have a pretty good ambient, economic ambient environment, at least relatively, that will make you succeed. So he says, okay, I've heard you. 
By the time I got back home, he had sent me an email. He says, look, you said so many interesting things. I'm going to send one or two of my people to come to Ghana to do some work. You know, they came, two of them came. By the end of the first week, he came to me and says, okay, so if you want to build a factory, what, what, what's your advice? I said, oh, well, you can build, but I think you can buy as well. You can develop and stuff. I said, oh, okay, where? So I did a lot of, you know, I did some research, etc. I said, oh, Tema, you can get this, you can get that, you can do the properties available for sale. I had a record pace by week two, they were negotiating to buy a factory. By the next two months, they were upholding the factory. Last month, he told me they were almost complete with the factory to manufacture in Ghana. And that would be what you would call a success story? Not yet. When it starts employing Ghanaians? Not yet. When it starts expanding? Not yet. When? Will you call it a success story? You see, story? Success, success is very personal. And it's not an issue of, oh, I wanted five cars. I've got five, so I'm successful. After the five cars, what happens? You're yeah, just going to be there and say, I'm successful. That's not an end all. You still have life to live. So for me, one factory is not what will measure my success. What will measure my success is that one day we look at the economy of Ghana. It is fully transformed into a manufacturing entity. We are an export-oriented country. We don't have the problems in the currency because we are exporting much more than we are importing. We have gotten jobs for our young people. They are working and they are producing and they are creating wealth. Because for me, till you get to the point of wealth, your success is measured, is half measured. And wealth doesn't mean that I am wealthy, so I'm going to buy a Rolls Royce, I'm going to buy a 10 house mansion. No. Wealth in the sense that you've created opportunity for other people to also participate in the economy and get a better life. That is building wealth. When I come back from this break, I'm going to be finding out from Yofi Grant, the CEO of GIPC, what's in this for the young people of Ghana and how do we leverage the relative success he's had over the past five years as CEO of GIPC to fast track the, the, fast track the agenda of creating many more successful Ghanaian entities built here in Ghana or partnering with foreign um, investors to create opportunity for the Ghanaian. This is Springboard, your venture investing in the engine room with Yofi Grant, CEO of GIPC. Please don't go away. There once was a man who had it all. He had skill. He had charisma. He was loved by all, but above all, he knew the importance of helping others, lifting others up. He knew the importance of giving other people an advantage so that they too would use that advantage to help others. All you need is that advantage that sets you apart from the rest. And when you discover that advantage, life's challenges don't seem so daunting anymore. That's where we come in. Enterprise, your advantage. was established in 1972 as the premier bank for the corporate and private sector in Ghana. 
From our very beginning, as the only Ghanaian bank serving all categories of businesses, we set a standard for excellence and innovation over the past 45 years. We've built a financially healthy and strong bank, demonstrated our commitment to our customers and to growing businesses, and exhibited originality and innovation at every turn. At UMB, our focus is built around people, service, products and technology. These are the key to our present success and our future triumphs. At UMB, we are poised to make a difference not only with our customers, but also in the banking industry. We invite you to share in our future. Our future starts now with you. Central University, we are not just giving theoretical knowledge, but also real-life practical immersion. Our projects and research are targeted at solving real-life problems within our built and natural environment. My name is Che Joseph Bafo, an architecture student. The faculty and facilities available to us make us industry ready. The projects I'm working on recently won an award when my colleagues and I visited the Netherlands. Central University makes you industry ready. Welcome back to Springboard, your virtual university, and to the engine room with Reginald Yofi Grant, the CEO of the Ghana Investment Promotion Center. I'm telling him the name Reginald is now come to stay on the big stage, not just your old schoolmates <laughs> and friends. And this is discussing Ghana as an investment destination. This is brought to you by the Springboard Roadshow Foundation and proudly sponsored by MTN Pulse, the enterprise group, UMB Bank, Central University with media support from the Multimedia Group and the Graphic Communications Group. On Tuesday, on page 18 of the Graphic Business, a full transcript of this conversation and all the lessons about how we can benefit from not just foreign direct investment, but also the offshoots that create opportunity for people born, bred here, doing business here, and who are on the lookout for opportunities as a result. So far, he has been telling us about the fact that MTN is a typical example, among many others, of how foreign direct investment cannot, can, can, can empower and expand our economy and then also create several of you mentioned six billion dollars already invested, and even more importantly, thousands of Ghanaian businesses created and employment created as a result of that investment. He says that a lot of the growth in our economy in the area of telecoms, hospitality, and also mining uh, are driven by foreign direct investment and the offshoots in terms of supply chain opportunities for local businesses. He tells a beautiful story about the Sheikh in Dubai and three uh, young men who had gone to learn abroad and who were employed in the company and were protesting at the discrimination in salaries and threatening to go on strike and being sent back, learning, taking on the knowledge transfer and then going on to own 30%. Can you imagine of the business that the he was originally employed in the story or the lesson is about knowledge transfer and learning he also talks about ghana's biggest selling points and he starts with being at the center of the universe something that the sporting crew tried very much to sell in one of our sporting engagements as ghana being the center of the universe and also talks about political stability the rule of law happiness and freedom something that you may not value but somebody out there says ah it's very 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 important for investment and he says ghana is on the go and seen as an african country that is setting the peace it also means that anything that threatens the rule of law any perception that the political stability that we have is under threat or being corroded or eroded or compromised would have direct implications for investment absolutely Absolutely. I mean, put yourself in the shoe of an investor and you want to go and put money in a country so bad because you see opportunity for growth. You see a market that is ready. And then suddenly there is political instability. You you'd definitely hesitate because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or next week or the next month um, because it will impact your business and you, your money will get stuck there. There will be no peace. There will be no security. And so you'll be worried. So it's very important, first of all, um, to understand that our success as a country, economically, also hinges quite a bit on our political stability. 
And that puts a lot of pressure on all sides of the political divide Absolutely. in terms of our language, in terms of our posture. Absolutely. Look, I'll tell you something. I mean, recently I, I was uh, engaged with an investor, a major investor, by the way, who is looking at a billion-dollar project. His team, and he had a team of 16 lawyers looking at the business case, and 16 lawyers, some of them financial analysts and stuff. And I was surprised at the depth of which they had gone to do their due diligence in Ghana, including quoting press, you know, press clips, what does this mean? Um, and so what happened? What happened in parliament after your elections? Um, what does it mean going forward? And I said, well, our parliament is working. It's a, um, a, a parliament that is split, fifth, a hung parliament that has two sides that are equal weight, et cetera, et cetera, with one weight, you know, counter levered by an independent. So, you know, um, at least there's peace, there's stability, and, and so that makes us say, well, okay, we can deal with that. But the fact that you have to speak the language of the investor, you need to understand his mind, what he's looking for, and you'd be surprised. Very often you think it's something special. No. It's the same things you and I are looking for. Peace, stability, happiness, um, you know, uh, predictability. That's what the investor wants. What he has that many of us may not have is capital. And so for somebody to leave his home in Europe or America to bring his money that he's got, he's worked hard to work, he needs to ensure that when he brings it here, that money is not going to get lost. And so that's very important. Now, the critical element in all this whole agenda of building an economy and the importance of investment is that no country in the world has developed without foreign direct investment. It's a, it's a, whether it's the U.S., whether it's China, uh, they all had their strategies. China, at a certain point, um, required the needed to transform after um, um, Deng Xiaoping. They needed to transform. It says, look, we need to get into the market economy because that's where we can grow wealth in our country. What did they do? They were a communist country. It wasn't a, li a liberal political state. So they created enclaves. Do you know that some of those enclaves, uh, which were special zones, were such that they made them tax-free for foreigners. All the local people were paying taxes. Why? Because they needed the foreign money to build it on their ground, on their soil. Many people look at, many people look at what we call free zones mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. and question the rationale behind creating tax-free status for foreigners. Are you, by this Chinese example, suggesting mm -hmm. that there is merit in creating a, a tax-free um, zone for foreigners? Well, the tax-free zones is not for foreigners. And very often people make the mistake that, I, I use a specific China example, but <clears throat> for us, a lot of our investment laws are uh, origin neutral. The, the mm. means that the rules are there, whether it's for a Ghanaian or a foreigner, you just need to comply with the rules. So, but we may decide that because we don't have revenue, we are not building enough, we haven't built an economy that um, we can get enough tax revenue for the government to do everything. We may decide that, okay, we need investment into infrastructure. That's a big ticket item. We need close to $8 billion a year to develop our infrastructure to narrow the gap between ourselves and maybe the OECD. Um, we need $2 billion every year to make sure that um, we continue with the free senior high school education program because it's important. Because to create in the medium term in the future a groundswell of better educated young people who can now work in an industrializing economy. So you're saying that for that reason, for that reason, there may be certain deliberate opportunities created in terms absolutely of, in terms of tax-free status for certain countries. Absolutely. Businesses. And it's open to both Ghanaians and foreigners? Yes, indeed. Origin neutral. Origin neutral. Let so me, Let's so, explore uh, one more point that you made that is very key to us. So you've, you mentioned Coco, and I'm, I'm going to reference a conversation that I had with um, Dr. Christian Pofo of, of Bloomberg, and he said Africa must move up the value chain. Absolutely. He drew a very beautiful picture, very beautiful on one hand, but also very scary on one hand. He says, if you take, for instance, um, the electric car and battery, um, economy he says mining is a two billion dollar economy refinery is a 40 billion dollar economy absolutely the chemicals a 271 billion economy 
the batteries or cells are a two trillion economy Absolutely. and electric cars are a seven trillion economy. economy. So His simple you, argument you can actually that see the trajectory, exactly, the trajectory. And it's not just a, 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 a linear growth, it's exponential. exponential. And so you mentioned yeah. some numbers in relation to how much we, ge we can generate from cocoa selling it raw vis-a-vis -vis the size of the chocolate um, and confectionery economy. Give me the, those numbers again. I want so I, I said that um, between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, we produce about 67% of the global um, cocoa beans um, supply. Mm -hmm. But that, averagely, is only $6 billion every year. But if you take chocolate alone, last year it was $160 billion. Now, if we produce 67% of the cocoa beans at a, by a, a, a finished product... 67%? Yes. And we totally get how much? Maybe average is six billion. Right. Out of potentially. I'll give the chocolate industry and how much is it? 160 billion a year. Right. That is where we should be. And even if we were to do ten percent of that, that's sixteen billion. Almost twice as much as we get from exporting sixty seven percent of the global cocoa. What beer. stops us? Investment. Right. Investment, technology you know, a mindset that says we are going to go forward and add value to these things. And it's just not Africa. Look, this is not Ghana. Africa as a continent is resource rich. Yet we export all our raw materials and import the finished goods into the continent. That's a narration that we are trying to change in Ghana. But what does it do in trying to industrialize? Then you are also creating opportunity for our young people. Let's talk about the young people of Ghana. How does this conversation benefit them? I mean, we are facing just like every other African country, a very youthful population with probably 300,000 plus turning out of uh, various institutions and apprenticeships and so on into the economy looking for jobs and opportunity and the public sector obviously not being able to accommodate them. Absolutely not. How do we, with this conversation, how do we use these platforms, these investment opportunities that we are talking about to empower our young people so that Sometime to come, a sheikh from Ghana will tell you a story about opportunity. Very simple. Let me tell you something, Albert. Mm -hmm. The more companies you invest in, mm -hmm. the bigger the companies become. The bigger the companies become, the more young people they can employ. The more young people they can employ, the greater opportunity you also create for those young people to build their own businesses. Now, the more businesses you build, out of the young people, out of the initial investment, the more the uh, opportunity for government to even collect these taxes. So it's in the mutual interest of government to ensure that you build businesses. And businesses are built by investment. And so when you invest in a business, the business can then grow and say that, okay, maybe I was producing 5,000 tons. Now I need to produce 20,000 tons. For that, I need more people. I need more graduates with engineering. I, I, I love that. I, I need more graduates with marketing. So I'll employ them. They also get employed. They work with this company and then behave like they shake. They say, ah, now I understand this business. I can set up a small factory in my village under the 1D1F. And so he also goes with a little capital and maybe a little help. If he doesn't have the help, he says, okay, let me look for a partner. Let me look for an investor. He gets that investor. He goes to his village. He builds this factory or he goes to his town or his district, builds this factory. He also employs people. Uh, a lot more people who have now gone to school can get jobs as managers, as uh, haulage people, as logistics people. So there's a big ecosystem that needs to develop, which is fueled by investment. And, and, and so indeed... In, so in your world, uh, in your world, everything is investment. I'm sure when you go to church and you are, the, the pastor is even preaching, you are thinking of investment. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, let's, let's go personal a bit. I'm sure, and, and these are very massive points that you're making, and we'll, yeah. I'll try and summarize them before we close. But, but you, let, let me tell you something which has become even more critical. I mean, recently, um, government in its bid to uh, combat post-COVID, you know, the post-COVID um, effect of, you know, global supply chain disruptions, etc., etc., uh, put up a plan to build our economy back better. We call it the Ghana CARES. COVID alleviation and revitalization of enterprises support program. It's a program that started in 2020 to 2024. Now it's a 100 billion CD program. Out of the 100 CD billions, um, um, 100 billion CDs, government would take only 30 
billion cities because that's as far as they can go. The remaining 70 billion cities is supposed to come from private sector and from investments. So we've, as a country, already agreed that it's important to attract investments in here and mobilize not just foreign direct investment, but indigenous investments into the enterprise. Very often, I'm accused as head of GIPC that, oh, you're only uh, bringing foreigners to take over all the business. The business is already here. There's nothing about them coming to take over. Most of them come and see opportunity and work on the opportunity. And that's the kind of mindset that I hope that our young people will see. Luckily, I'm seeing a lot of it these days. There are a lot of people, kids coming out of school and says, no, I want to do my own business. They start small and build up. And that is the sort of evolution that we want to see in our economy, where people now start thinking, look, instead of just coming out of school, I want to buy a big car, get a big house and do that. Let me just delay that a bit. Let me build a big business. That big business in the near future will give me more cars and more houses than I, I need anyway. What 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 are we doing to enable these young entrepreneurs who have started? And and if you went on Instagram, you'll be extremely impressed. Absolutely. I mean, things that when I when we came out of school in the in the out of university in the in 1990, you would never see a graduate see they're going out there to do. <laughs> People are not just doing it, but doing it with pride. And that is probably one of the, beauty, the most beautiful things about this generation. But they also will tell you when you talk to them that it's a very difficult terrain. It how, is. How do we make it a bit easier? You for know, these young Albert, people? the truth of the matter is that globally, the statistics for startups are very dire. Out of every 100 startups, it's estimated that only 10% 10, um, 10 of it, that's 10 of them will survive. Um, so it's, it's a hard lot, and it's very difficult. It requires self-sacrifice, it requires capital, it requires discipline, it requires knowledge, it requires technology these days. So it's not easy. Um, but you can only build a groundswell of businesses when at least you put in the effort to try and do so. At GIPC, for example, we every year have this youth entrepreneurship forum where we bring young people to talk about their businesses, we bring mentors in, we have speed mentoring sessions, we teach them little basic things, and then we actually showcase some of them to investors. We have a pitching series as well. We have an exhibition. This year, we are looking to um, tie it in with quite a number of even government agencies. And maybe Springboard should become a partner to that. We are looking at um, tying in with the YEA, NYA, all these agencies to bring, make it bigger and make sure that we have a lot more young people start to critically think about not just getting a job, but also thinking about how they can build their own jobs. The You Start program from government is a very big initiative that will put a lot more people into that thinking mode and help young people want to start businesses. We are also, um, we are also conceptualizing a startup exhibition where we'll, get, we'll, do, we'll do a screening, get a, a couple of partners, the banks, the uh, um, advisory companies to help us screen maybe 10, 20 companies and do an exhibition. They will do presentations uh, over a day. We'll bring investors, the banks, we'll bring business people to sit and listen to them. So uh, we start to start initiating that mindset in people. And I'm seeing a lot of brilliant businesses by young people. Um, and, and they're struggling. And so I think that there is an opportunity um, to, to sort of link investment to, to those, you know, opportunities that exist. And that's how you get more businesses, more businesses, more taxes, more revenue for government. Because there is a certain trajectory that you can take. But for the young person listening to this, the future is yours. Albert, you and I, I doubt will be in existence in the next 50, 60 years. That's the reality of life. Yeah. But somebody who's 20 years today is likely to be here in the next 50 years. His future, he can determine his future. If you let, let's wrap up by, by, by asking you if, if, you met, if you met a young person who has gone to Motown where you went, mm -hmm. or probably maybe not even such a privileged secondary school, but has gone to a rural secondary school, but has come out of university very excited, or maybe probably done an apprenticeship, learned some skills, mm -hmm. very excited, and wants direction for the future. What would be the one big lesson you would give them from your own experience? Not just the mountain top, but the valley experience. No. What would be that one big thing that you would tell them that, that can help them to find their own space? I'll tell them 
to focus on their dream with discipline. Focus on your dream with discipline. Why? Because you must dream, first of all. And you, you dream big things and make big things and be able to do it. But you will not achieve those big things if you don't, you're not disciplined enough to understand the rubrics of the big things. So you dream that one day you'll be the biggest what, car manufacturer in Ghana as an individual. What are you going to do to become the biggest car manufacturer in Ghana? That requires discipline. First of all, that dream must have a plan. And you only execute that plan with discipline. And that is something that today, I mean, sometimes you find wanting in a lot of people, that they don't have the patience to be disciplined enough, like the Sheikh did, um, to build their own future. Um, some of them also come out, and they don't have a personal vision. Their personal vision is a straightforward one. Let me get a job, let me get paid, and that's it. What do you want to see? What I want to see is a lot more aggression in our young people, in your self-improvement, um, dreaming, and getting the discipline to achieve that dream. What's next for you if you don't? A lot more of what I've done before. Impacting people, impacting my country positively. I, I think that each one of us has a mission in this world. And sometimes God gives you a job to do and you don't even know it. I mean, I, I, I didn't study anything with marketing in my life. I didn't even study finance in my life. I ended up working what, as an what, investment what, what, did you study, what did you study in school? Psychology. I wrote about that in one of our, our books. <laughs> that you, just trying to get people to understand how your education and your career pursuits could have a different trajectory. Yes, and I... You, I you, you did psychology. Yeah. And I remember the, my favorite examples at the time, George Ander, who did biochemistry, was doing very well in marketing. Right. You did psychology, you were doing investment banking at the time, and now yes. you're doing marketing. Yes. That's a very interesting world. Isn't yes, it? because you see, I try to tell a lot of the young people, and I tell my kids all the time that going to school and, and going to the university is not just to get a degree. I tell you, it's to get an education. Now, what's an education? An education is being able to learn the bricks of logic and knowledge and information and putting them together to solve problems. Education helps you understand the past, the present and the future and how you can use those experiences to solve problems that confront you. Even, though, even if those problems are unique and are novel, you can still use your education as a building block to solve those problems because you learn in school what other people have done before, how they've done it. You learn history, the experience that people have gone through. That will help you understand how the future is going to look like if you take certain situations to put there. You learn engineering because you want to understand what the numbers and figures all, all mean. And you use that to, be, to solve problems. So when all is said and done, yeah. it's problem solving, problem solving. Yeah. Problem solving, problem solving, problem solving. When I come so back you to you for your concluding thoughts, you yeah. I'm going to ask you a very simple question. Uh, I've, I've observed over the past few years a number of car manufacturing companies come into the country. I'm going to take that for your closing thoughts, ask you what problem that solves. Here we go with my, my 12 points from this conversation with Yofi Grant in the engine room. Number one is about the beautiful story of MTN and how a six billion plus investment has created thousands of Ghanaian businesses and by extension, employment for so many through the value chain and the expansion that it has brought into the economy as an example. The second is about FDI or foreign direct investment as a growth point. He's saying that a lot of the growth in our economy in the areas of telecoms, mining, hospitality, banking have been driven by foreign investment and the offshoots it creates in the local value chain and supply chain. The third is about knowledge transfer, that beautiful story about the sheikh in Dubai telling him about going to work and threatening to go on strike and being sent back by his uncle to go and learn and how he now got to own 30% of the company he was employed in. A lesson simply about observing and learning from foreigners that invest in our economy. The fourth is about Ghana's biggest selling point, the center of the universe sanctity of contracts, political stability, and a country on the go, respecting the rule of law, and always setting the pace in the continent. The fifth is how do you measure success? And he says, it's not just about one more investor coming in, 
but how the big picture of all these investments empower our people and create an ecosystem where the Ghanaian believes that they live in their country and they can have a better world as a result. The sixth is about value addition and the question for Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire together producing 67% to thirds of the world's cocoa but earning only six billion out of a potential 160 billion. Those numbers make you cringe. <laughs> See, there's yes, so they much do. that is possible. And, and that's just the chocolate yes. side. Not right. to mention the liquor, the butter, the right. you know, that is going to the cosmetics industry. And and when you said if only we got ten percent of that, the look in your eyes, you could see the envy. I know, right? Because <laughs> you just think this will make a world of difference for Absolutely. In, in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. So that is another point about value addition, the point that was made earlier on in this show by uh, Dr. Christian Pofu. And then also the seventh was about that simple what what do you want to call it? Equation. The more business opportunities we create for investment the more businesses we build, and then the more young people it employs, and the more our economy expands. And when the economy expands, then more young people can create new businesses, and guess what? The government can get more taxes, and we all live happily ever after. So that starts with investment, and guess what? Ends with investment. Yes. The eighth is about GIPC's Youth Investment Forum, and you're saying that you want to expand that one and make it a trigger point mm -hmm. for much more focus on young investors. The ninth, it's a very interesting point that anything that subtly, even subtly threatens our political stability and security makes investors shake. And you gave me a very interesting lesson that investors cut newspaper clips, take sound bites, listen to what is happening in parliament and ask, what does this mean for our business? And sometimes have as many as 20 lawyers inspecting everything to see, does yeah. this threaten what we are doing? Absolutely. And the lesson for, for then for all, all those in power as well as the opposition and everyone in the political landscape is to be careful what we see and be careful Absolutely. what we do. Right. The next, uh, the tenth point is about the, the, the neutrality, origin neutrality of our investment opportunities, the tax-free mm -hmm. zone and so on. You see the, the opportunities are there and they mm -hmm. don't look at whether you're a Ghanaian or a foreigner. So Ghanaians can also explore them mm -hmm. and take advantage of them. The 11th is your advice to a young person starting out there. You say, focus on your dream with discipline. First, you must dream, but follow that dream with discipline and you will eventually arrive at your destination. The last point is about education. You say going to school grants you an education, but that education is to help you to use the present, the past, the present, and the future, and your understanding of it to do only one thing, problem solving. Absolutely. On that note, Yofi Grant, just to sign off in a minute, I've just been observing with interest the fact that VW, um, Japan Motors, a number of auto manufacturing companies have decided to invest in Ghana. Just in one minute, tell me, what problem are they solving? Well, they solved the problem was, you know, the biggest import item for us in Ghana today is cars, used cars. Really? And, yeah, yeah. That's the biggest ticket, one ticket item, is uh, cars, etc. But also just, just not, not the problem being solved for us, but for the sub-region and the continent, that we can actually assemble cars here and supply the markets around us. It's a formidable idea. And almost five of some of the biggest um, car manufacturing companies have started assembling here. But you ask why? To close, it's the story. The Ghana story is an amazing story. It's an, a story of recovery, resilience, a can-do attitude, and a country on the go and the move. The next time we get this, to have this conversation, the Ghanaian must be as excited about Ghana as people outside the country are. Because I tell you what, especially when I go to a place like Nigeria, they say you guys are in heaven. And this but we, we it seem to, it. I know. <laughs> I mean, I even told one of my presentations after I finished. You know, one of them was saying, "Oh, Ghana, we know Ghana." It's a you have no problem. problem. And I said, "Yes." <laughs> I only close by saying that I believe that God lives in Ghana. God lives in Ghana. The closing thoughts of Yofi Grant in this conversation. Yofi, thanks for coming. So, uh, You're most welcome. So much for coming it's my pleasure for this beautiful conversation. Let's do this again. Absolutely. Let's do this again. Always ready. Right. So this has been Springboard, your virtual investor, hanging out with Yofi Grant, telling the story of Ghana as an investment destination. If you have learned something today, God lives in Ghana, and so many people out there look at this country and say, this is it. We hope that we can have this conversation again and see ourselves that this 
is it. With that, on behalf of Team Springboard, ably led by Comfort and the Springboard Ratio Foundation, as well as our sponsors and partners, MTN Pulse, the Enterprise Group, UMB Bank, Central University, and our media partners, the, the Multimedia Group and the Graphic Communications Group. This is Albert Okran saying, this week, look out for this story on My Joy Online, look out for this story on the Springboard website, and look out for it also in the Graphic Business on page 18 on Tuesday. In the meantime, Albert Okran saying, God bless you. God bless you and God bless you.